you, you want to design a solar system for your van, your schoolie, your off-grid cabin. Okay. Where do you start? Well, I'm going to try and break this down in the easiest way that I can so you can design your own system. Qualifications. I'm still a licensed journeyman electrician in the state of Utah. I have a bachelor's degree in electronic engineering technology. Let's talk about it. When you say solar system, it's one of the first things that people want to do is figure out how many solar panels can I fit on the van and how many batteries can I fit inside my rig. This is wrong. And this is, this is critical. Step one you have to start from the load side okay so if we use a, a water analogy right which is which is useful a lot of times in electricity okay you've got water coming in right and that's like your solar you've got a tank of water and that is like your batteries and then you've got essentially a hose that comes off of that well the hose that comes off of that that's what's called your load so this is going to be lighting. This is going to be convenience outlets. This will be your fridge. This will be heat, cooktops. This will be anything that draws electricity. Okay, And this is where is really critical. You need to sit down and create a spreadsheet of all of the things that you are going to use inside your rig. Okay, So we're going to break all those down. I'm going to take one piece here. I'm going to do an example, but you have to do this for every single thing. And the more time, the more consideration, the more work that you put into this, the better your end result will be because you need to understand how much water you need out of that hose at the end of your system so that you understand how big a tank you need to have if there's no water coming in and to decide how big you need that feeder hose to be into your tank to get it refilled if you have X amount of light per day, okay? Okay, so we're gonna look at the Dometic CF X3 75 liter dual zone portable refrigerator and freezer. So this has refrigerator section and freezer section. This is a nice stuff. Dometic makes nice fridges. So this fridge is coming in just under $1,300. And if you compare this to, for the size, um, you know, 75 liters, I mean, you could damn near get that in a dorm fridge for a couple hundred bucks. You're gonna pay about six times that here. There's a reason you're paying that, right? It's the efficiency. But as I scroll through on this Amazon ad for it, I'll tell you what I'm not finding. I'm not finding how much power this actually takes. This is kind of a weird thing, right? Why is it telling me how efficient it is and how it's got Bluetooth capabilities? And I'm not trying to hit Dometic and I'm not trying to hit Amazon. What I'm telling you is, is that the information that is actually important about this fridge, beside how much food it can hold and yeah, you want to know that and how cold it gets. But the real information that you need for designing your solar system, you're going to have to go a step deeper. Okay, and you're going to go to, you're going to take that model number and you're going to write after it amps or amp rating or amp draw, okay, and put that into a Google search, okay. Now you're going to get to the Dometic site. You need to scroll down and you're going to look under specifications, okay. And this is where I'm going to break this down a little bit for you because according to Dometic site, with an input voltage of 120 volts AC, okay, that it requires 0.94 amps. So this is at full draw, right? This is as much as, as it can draw. So it's only drawing an amp. But this is when you're plugged into the wall. Okay? This is not running on a solar setup. A solar setup where you're running at 12 volts at full draw, this is going to draw 9.6 amps. So you see that it's essentially drawing 10 times as many amps at there. And here for a second, I want to break down. Let's talk about this. 
there's a thing called Ohm's Law. Okay, And this is true, and it's a way to calculate different values for it. So if you know the voltage, you know the amperage, you can find out how many watts total power draw. Okay, If you understand the resistance and you know the voltage, you can find out how many amps you're drawing. Okay, It can get complicated, but for the terms that we're using here, most of the time we're going to be talking about volts, amps, and watts. Now, there's also another term thrown in here called amp hours. And amp hours, if you know what the voltage are, can be converted to watts just for simple conversion. And that's what I suggest that you do, okay? So, if we scroll down here into performance, right? Now, we're going to see that at 12 volts DC, with an ambient temperature of 90 degrees outside, so again, if it's up to 90 degrees in your van, and keeping your internal temperature at 39 degrees. Most people want their fridges a little cooler than 39 degrees. You're gonna find your stuff doesn't last very long. I keep mine at more like 34, okay? The amp hours per hour are 1.43, okay? This, this is what you need to know, okay? It's drawing 12 volts, 1.43 amp hours per hour. And that goes into the spreadsheet. And now we are going to continue with that list. We're gonna look at the lights that we put in. We're going to think about charging our cell phones. We're going to think about our computer. We're going to look at inverters, we're look at everything else. So we're going to add up in our spreadsheet and we're going to come up with a total amount. Okay, so let's try and understand how amp hours to watt hours work. Now, I like to calculate everything in watt hours just because I think it's easier, but one way or another, you need to get this into the same numbers, okay? Otherwise, you're going to be off by a factor of at least 10. So. The difference between watt hours and amp hours, okay? If we take amp hours of something for say, a 100 amp hour battery, and we multiply it by the volts of that battery, which for most standard batteries is 12 volts, okay? We're gonna end up with 1200 watt hours, okay? So you've now got a 1200 watt hour battery or a 100 amp hour battery. Well, and now what do you do with it? I now have 1,200 watt hours. What does that mean? That means that that battery will give you 1,200 watts for one hour, or it will give you 200 watts for six hours, okay? And this is how really everything is rated, is either in watt hours or amp hours. Batteries tend to be in amp hours. Solar panels always come in watt hours. And now let's get back to working on that spreadsheet. Okay, so let's talk about what I'm gonna call derating. Now, I'm, I'm misusing that term here, but it's important that you understand that in every component, on every side, so this is the, the supply, storage, and load side, you're going to lose something. So this is resistance in the wire, resistance in your connections, a little bit of corrosion there, the heat that's lost in places. It means that no matter what, you're always losing something, right? So a 100 watt panel, the truth is, you're never gonna get 100 watts out of it, right? Even if you're in direct sun, optimal conditions, you just cleaned it with your freshest pair of underwear, you're just not going to get 100 watts out of a 100 watt panel, okay? And a fridge is never going to be as efficient as they say. You and your installation will be unique, but you will never, ever reach 100%. My suggestion is that you do a 20% increase or decrease just to give yourself a little margin of error. You can do 15, you do as you need to do, but in all your calculations, you need to make sure that you're always hinging your bet on having 
more power coming in, more storage, and that your loads are going to take more than you think they are. So also in your list, I'm sure you're going to have things that are AC only. Now for this, in your standard installation, you're going to run an inverter for this. And if you've gone online and you looked at inverters, even though you shouldn't be at that part of the process yet, you're going to see them say things like 95 to 98% efficient, right? And so you're thinking, well, that's almost negligible loss. It's, it's just really not true. Number one, that is the maximum efficiency that they could possibly have, and that will be at max load, okay? When they are at smaller loads, they can be up to 30%. They can lose up to 30% of the power. And this goes into the fan that cools it off, the heat that is generated, which is why you need that fan, right? So you need to calculate this in additionally into your spreadsheet of all your loads. So if you have items that you know have to be run on AC, you need to calculate probably an additional 10% inefficiency because you're going to have to run that inverter for them. And since I'm actually having to put together a spreadsheet for this fake van, uh, let's look at the fan. So I looked at the fantastic vent and found that it draws 3 amps at 12 volts. So according to Ohm's law, that gives me 36 watts okay so 36 watts if you rate that 20 percent it doesn't go through the inverter it's straight 12 volts so it works there and how many hours used per day now this is a really critical thing on this list and how many hours you're going to use something per day because for example i put a microwave on here that draws 700 watts the truth is you're probably only going to use a microwave for maybe a few minutes a day. So why used 0.1 hours per day? So again, I'm not counting on somebody using it very much. So six minutes out of every day. But the fan, you know, that's something that you might want to run that all day and all night. So let's see. Let's just go ahead and calculate that at 24. And that gives us over a 24 hour period at 36 uh, watt hours that uh, it would cost us 1000 watts per day. So you'll see here on this spreadsheet that it can yield some surprising results. Surprising to me that potentially the fridge could only take half as much as running the fan. So this shows that for our little fake rig, which I just made up in the last five minutes. So this is not a real thing. This is just an exercise. And I would think that this list could take you really some weeks to kind of go through your daily life, maybe keep a little or a tablet. Every time you use power, and especially if you're going to work on the road, how many hours you need it and just exactly what you need. Maybe you can do some of your work offline. So if you're using Starlink, you don't have to have it on all the time that you're working. Maybe you have to have it on for eight hours a day. The more that you understand about what you really need in terms of power consumption, the better your system will be designed. So take the time. But for our little fake system here, total watt hours are 2,851. Okay, now let's talk about some other stuff. So I really like to work backwards from the way a lot of people do this. And so now that we've calculated what our total loads are going to be, now let's work back and think about what our total storage needs to be because that's the next step in there, right? So we have uh, just under 3,000 watt hours needed. So how big a battery do we need? Well, okay, we take that 2,851, and we divide it by 12, and we get that we need 237 amp hours of storage per day. Now, again, this is where things can get dangerous, 
because batteries don't work well being completely brought up and they really don't work well being completely depleted okay so yes we need 237 amp hours and and right now we're just thinking about what if we just have the water tank what if we're not filling this water tank from anywhere else what if this is just the water tank what if we are in the middle of the longest solar eclipse ever how how long could we last well we know we need 237 amp hours so if we buy amp hour batteries right and we buy three 100 hour batteries right that gives us a total of 300 which would leave 63 amp hours in total capacity so leaving us about 20 percent in reserve and this is thinking that we don't have the ability to put in a drop of solar so the question is how much battery is enough how much is too much is there such thing as too much are there other systems out there batteries can get as complicated as you want them to get and almost right out of the gate somebody is going to immediately say you gotta go lithium you gotta go lithium they're so much better well there are advantages to lithium and there are disadvantages to lithium and I've had a number of people that I've met out on the road who have had lost a cell or two of lithium and it has been devastating to their overall battery capacity they are difficult to replace out on the road and because of sort of the nature of a lithium battery you can't just really replace certain portions of it not unless you're smarter than I am um, there are people out there and uh, if you're interested uh, our friends Emily and Clark Clark is a genius and he has developed a system to create a hybrid between lead cell batteries and lithium batteries and it uses this this big contactor in between that won't allow you to overcharge the batteries and then he uses the natural resistance inside the batteries to give you the overall mix it's it's very good and, and he's got long explanations on it it's a very interesting system if you're interested look for the link below for most people especially if you're really traveling out there unless you have huge power needs unless you are working every single day you're running Starlink you're running all these computers I know people aren't going to like this, but I, I really recommend that you go with lead acid. They're a little hardier, um, fewer problems when you get out there, and they're problems that are fixable, and they have solutions to repairing or replacing your entire system that are reasonable. And especially if you're going south of the United States, it can be very difficult um, unless you stay at a place for long term to get replacement parts for a lithium setup. You do as you will. Either way, you need to understand where your batteries, how much real capacity you can get out of your batteries. And that's going to change from battery to battery. If you're using the standard battery inside your car, you really only want to use like that top 20%. If you're using what's called a deep cell, so this is also still a lead acid battery, you can take that battery down a lot further and these are kind of more standard for house batteries in in a rig and of course uh, lithium batteries give you the ability to um, drain and charge more times without them going out but honestly on the road I can tell you that I see more people replacing lithium batteries out here than I see people replacing lead acid and I know some of you are like so pissed that I said that uh, I'm just telling you my experience has not been great and I've had a number of lithium batteries in drills and cordless equipment and I've lost almost every okay so let's say for safety's sake you have decided you want to go with 400 amp hours of battery and if you've got the space I certainly recommend that and now is the appropriate time to start thinking about how much space you have, where you can put it, where are the batteries in relation to where you are 
so you're not going to build up any kind of sulfuric acid. It's nice to have some kind of a bulkhead between you and the batteries or some kind of a compartment because lead acid batteries do, do off gas some of that. So. Um, so now you figured out how many batteries you have. All right, so now you have 400 amp hours at 12 volts, right? So what does it take to charge that? Well, all right, let's work our way up to the solar system. Everybody knows panels come rated in, in watts, right? So 100 watt panels, 200 watt panels, 175 watt panels. All right, these are going to come down. Okay, whatever wattage you have up on your roof is going to come down and go into the, a solar controller, and this is going to this is going to tend your batteries. This is going to increase the life of your batteries. It is not safe, not advisable, and unsafe to wire your solar panels directly into your batteries. It needs to go through a solar controller. The solar controller needs to be rated for the amount of Solar panel, battery, the amperage, you need to make sure. You also need to think about your wire sizes here. So there are a lot of good guides out there to give you uh, appropriate wire sizing principles for your system and how many amps uh, you're putting through it. But okay, let's talk about solar panels. You need to charge 400 amp hours of batteries okay so let's multiply that by 12 again right to recharge that right in one hour you would need 4,800 watts of solar so you would need 4,800 watt solar panels good luck <laughs> You be hanging them off the side and down the road. Maybe you can drag them behind you. Maybe you could get a trailer and you could drag 100 watt panels behind you. Okay, so I'm being a smart ass there. You don't need that many panels. And why? Because you don't have to charge your system within an hour, right? You've got more time than that, more hours of sun than that per day. But, and this is where again something gets complicated that, that could look from the math simple you need to know where you are and you need to know where you're going so there are uh, solar efficiency ratings for pretty much anywhere in the US and this is going to change based on the time of year um, if you're especially in the north you're always going to get more efficient solar power out of your panels during the summer because of the angle of the Sun the straighter the sun shines on a panel, the closer you get to to your maximum yield. A 100 watt solar panel will produce around 425 watt hours of power in a day. So the math there is 100 watts times five hours with a 15% derating, 425 watt hours. Again. That's going to change depending on where you are, if you parked under a tree, what time of year it is. There's a lot of other factors. Just a cloudy day um, can take up to 80% of the power out of the sun. Just, just a wispy cloud that you wouldn't even hardly notice. But it, it changes uh, a photovoltaic panel's efficiency drastically. So, I mean, you look at it. 100 watt panels only giving you 425 watts back in per day. Let's go ahead and put this into our spreadsheet. Well, if you're following me on the math, you can see this is a problem because after we derate these panels, this is showing that we would need 1100 watt panels there's no way that we're going to have space for 11 panels on a van. So, we're going to have to start figuring something else out. Well, the truth is, only so much can be done. 
Solar panels, although they get better every single year, are only so efficient, and you're only going to have so much space on top of your van. So, hopefully, you haven't bought any of that stuff that you had out there. Now's the time to go back through your list and look at your loads and think about what you need, how many hours you can do it in, or alternative solutions. Of course, the other potential answer is to take a small generator or that occasionally you have to stop in at a place and plug in and recharge your system. So these are all possible things and unfortunately they're what make van life a little bit challenging, especially for those that are still trying to work remotely, digital nomads or, or people that just love to, you know, game all day. I hope this has been helpful for you. Again, trust the math. And when you get past the planning stage, hopefully I'll come out with another video. Hints and tips for your solar installation. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe.